I've had the benefit of knowing Dennis Bushnell by email for a while now. And it's been a real pleasure. And as you all know, I know all of you by email too. And email is a pretty interesting way to know somebody, it turns out. And uh, it's particularly interesting when you got somebody who's a brainiac. And so I would, I would say something by email like, what do you think of that? And then about 20 minutes later, I'd get this 40-page document back from Dennis all about everything that's ever been thought about that with 10 pages of, of documentation behind it. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. And I'm really, really pleased that he's with us this evening to share his thoughts with us. Uh, now, I often do this, and I'm going to do it again tonight. Uh, Dennis is an overachiever. I'll just put it that way. And there's no way, when I start reading this to you, which I apologize for in advance, you'll understand why I'm reading it instead of trying to paraphrase it. <clears throat> so as you already know, he is chief scientist at NASA, Langley. As chief scientist, Dennis is responsible for technical oversight and advanced program formulation with an emphasis on atmospheric sciences and structures, materials, acoustics, flight electronics, control software, instruments, aerodynamics, aero, thermodynamics, hypersonic air breathing propulsion, computational sciences, and systems optimization for aeronautics, spacecraft, exploration, and space access. That's the first paragraph. <laughs> Dennis is a member of the National Academy of Engineering, a fellow of ASME, AIAA, and the Royal Aeronautical Society, and a member of the TechCast panel, a group of international experts engaged in technology forecasting. He has served as reviewer and editor for 40 journals and organizations and has made seminal contributions in the area of biofuels, biomass as petroleum replacements sourced from wastelands and saline wastewater via halophytes and algae. This is a bio thing. Dennis developed the riblet approach to turbulent drag reduction, high-speed quiet tunnels for flight, apical boundary layer transition research, advanced computational approaches for laminar flow control, regenerative aero braking for Martian entry, electron beam freeform fabrication, and advanced hypervelocity air breathing and aeronautical concepts with revolutionary performance potential. <laughs> That's what I said to Dennis just now. <clears throat> uh, he has contributed to national programs including Sprint, HSCT, SST, Fast Ship Gemini, Apollo, Ram, Viking, X-15, F-18EF, patent holder for the fix to the wing drop problem, shuttle, NASP, submarine, torpedo technology, America's Cup racers, Navy railgun, maglev trains, and planetary exploration. Dennis originated and organizes a yearly workshop for the U.S. Army Training and Doctrine Command, TRADOC, on future technology warfare out of which has grown the Army Red franchise, the preferred national security future operating environment utilized by the U.S. Army, Navy, and Joint Forces Command. Obviously a slacker. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis, please come up. <laughs> Dennis has access, as I mentioned in the agenda, to an incredible array of opportunities and technologies uh, from the bottom of the ocean throughout outer space. And this evening he's going to share with us uh, ideas of some of the largest problems that we face and some of the solutions we might find there. Thank you. Okay, boss. <coughs> uh, good evening. Among other activities for NASA, the National Security Apparatus writ large, and the academies. I work, where is it all going? Major tax issues and opportunities. So we're gonna start off with a Cook's tour of some tax, then briefly the societal issues, and then I'm gonna describe four greater than a trillion dollar a year new business opportunities going forward to address the major societal issues, and then some. So let's do tax first. Uh, the poster child coming out of the IT bio nano quantum energetics tech revolution is, of course, uh, AI, robotics, and autonomy. The computers got big enough around 12, enough data so that we could do neural nets seriously, and increasing number of niche areas, as you all know, uh, many at or better than human. Then there's, because of the success of the IBM Blue Brain Project, which some of you may remember, there's now human brain projects here in Europe, China, at billions plus dollars a year, 
to nanosection a neocortex and replicate it in silicon for human level brain replicants in about five to 10 years, people are now projecting. Uh, and uh, Ray Kurzweil projected all that around 2000. Uh, then there's emergence. Turns out if you make something complex enough, it wakes up. Uh, the humans evolved over the past couple of million years as superb hunter-killer gatherer groups. And in that context, we would have a problem. We would evolve a piece of our brain, have another problem, another piece. Eventually, we evolved enough pieces so that we woke up. And people think the web is starting to wake up. What you may not know is that a friend of mine, Steve Thaler, about 20 years ago, uh, determined that he could make the machines create and invent an Imagineer. And he created the Imagination Engine, uh, which has produced better toothpaste for Pamala, better words for the Air Force, far more ideas than cities full of people on milliwatts 24-7, 365. And the approach was to create uh, quasi-random combinatorials and then use the superb speed and memory of the machine to evaluate all these combinatorials. So it's something like cats walking on uh, the computer, okay, and you just evaluate from the system's point of view very, very rapidly what all that looks like and what's the best, and, and it's just superb. Okay, uh, then we go down to renewable energy, the usual and the unusual. The usual are PV, wind, geothermal, biomass, and hydro, all of which are now at or below cost parity with fossil carbon. Uh, therefore, the nukes, although they're not fossil carbon, they're also too expensive. And so we had 108 nukes, we're down to 98 nukes and dropping. Uh, the coal plants are closing. PV is selling in the major markets now for 1.77 cents a kilowatt hour. Wind is now selling for two cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, the renewable costs are still dropping much. They've been dropping very much over the last 10 years. Their efficiencies are increasing. 65% of all new generation worldwide is renewables. They generate the renewables today, 25% of all electricity worldwide. And some are starting to discuss what I haven't heard since the 50s, which is, uh, and this was in the 50s in connection with nukes, energy too cheap to meter. Energy too cheap to meter, okay? And that will mean, as we'll go along, I'll indicate some really big differences going forward. Uh, they have very high capacity, these renewables. They have uh, 16,000 exajoules versus 400, which we need to take care of all fossil carbon. Uh, there are several untapped renewables, which include heat exchangers in the Gulf Stream and a high altitude wind, 30,000 foot jet stream wind off of the East Coast, which NASA is working with five companies to tap. Uh, <coughs> And each of those has twice the U.S. installed grid power. Now, the power companies are really worried about this. Uh, one power company came to me and said, you know, going forward, I think that I can make more money by selling high-speed Internet off of my power lines than I can off of selling power. Uh, folks love not paying fuel costs. Uh, going along with that, of course, is energy storage. There's stationary grid, home, uh, industrial plant, weight-insensitive weight energy storage, like the flow batteries and so forth, coming along well. And then there's the very much weight-sensitive uh, transportation energy storage. All, there's, there's tremendous monies going into this now. Capability and cost are getting much better. We, NASA, I happen to be on the patent have invented a nuclear battery. Thermionics, the current ones before this, were at 10 watts per kilogram of isotope. This one is 22 kilowatts per, is per, gram, uh, per, per kilogram of isotope. Uh, and people are extremely interested in this for a lot of reasons, uh, one of which is to go mine asteroids, uh, but, but, you know, but a lot of other reasons. Uh, 
This thing utilizes nuke waste. The cesium in nuke waste is one of the ways to do it. So you can shovel in nuke waste into this nuke battery, and it produces electricity at about a cent a kilowatt hour. And uh, so we're working with DOD, Savannah River, on that. Uh, people are interested in propelling ships with this. They're interested in doing mining, both here and on asteroids. They're interested in using it for manufacturing, like aluminum and so forth. In terms of chemical batteries, lithium ion is best. Everybody knows, well, it's not. Lithium metal batteries are going to come out uh, the first part of next year at twice the energy density of lithium ion up at uh, 500 kilowatt hours per kilogram, twice lithium ion. And lithium air batteries are 10 times lithium ion. And uh, the people at Argonne have been able to recharge lithium air batteries 750 times, which is the ball game. And then there's positrons. Positrons are anti matter. They're, they're anti-electrons. Uh, positrons, when they annihilate with electrons, are 100% mass to energy conversion, and therefore they're 10 to the ninth times chemical instead of fission fusion, which are only 10 to the sixth, 10 to the seventh. And we are now able to store these for 1,000 minutes, uh, which means they're available. Humans are now becoming cyborgs. We have cochlear implants to hear. Artificial retinas to see, artificial hearts to live, artificial limbs to move, artificial organs to functions, and brain chips. There's a couple hundred thousand people wandering around with brain chips now to fix congenitally defective brains and increasingly to fix memory and other things. DARPA's working on brain chips for super soldiers. And people are now working thanks to uh, Musk and other people funding uh, direct machine brain communications, the, the, it's not us versus them, us versus the machines, we're merging. And this is the human evolution of the humans. There is no more natural evolution of anything. People are convinced that the human evolution of everything is 10 million times faster than any natural evolution. And so this is just part of the human evolution of the humans, which will apply in a little bit when I talk about something else. Then there's tell everything, which we've been doing f since IT developed in the past two or three decades. Telework, over, over half of the workforce does some kind of telework. Teleshopping, which is taken down to big box stores and Am Amazon's arising. Teleeducation, there's 380,000 courses on the web now a huge number of them free, including the courses from some of the most prestigious and best universities in the country. They've put it all out on a web free. You can go get your education now anytime you want, absolutely free, and you can get it certified in many cases for free. And companies increasingly, they don't want degrees. They want certification because what the students learn in their freshman year is obsolete these days. The way technology is going by the time they graduate, much less anything else. Okay, uh, tele, okay, then there's, there's uh, telemedicine, uh, and we, NASA, put uh, the uh, uh, AI onto oncology, and the results were four to five times better for diagnosis, treatment, and prevention at four to five times cheaper because the machines kind of sort of have a problem cashing checks. Uh, <laughs> Then there's teletravel with five senses virtual reality, which is now commercially available. And so therefore, you can do anything you want virtually. It's all in our heads. The rest of this is just to keep the head going, OK? And uh, you can walk down a tropical beach anytime you want. You can feel the sand, feel the wind, OK? You can do this at any time you want, with anyone you want, be anyone you want, and do anything you want. It's all in our heads, okay? Then there's uh, telepolitics we've had since the 60s, telebanking and telecommerce, which is endemic. The, the, the IRS keeps begging me, please don't file on paper. Uh, telemanufacturing, which is printing locally. 
telesocialization, the kids in the kindergarten are now texting people across the playground instead of going and physically interacting with them. Some people hate this, but this is just the human evolution of the humans. This is what we are evolving to. Okay, then uh, there's uh, teleshopping uh, is now uh, 50 times less uh, impact on the environment. And because of, of uh, the tele travel, there's less physical travel, less miles driven per person per year. Quantum tech, quantum computing, this is the next big little thing beyond nano. Uh, increasing investments, particularly in quantum computing. Orders of magnitude sensor improvements, uh, particularly interferometers for space, three to five orders of magnitude better. Quantum computing projections from the people that really do this told me what they are, and I won't repeat them. They are so ridiculously large that I, that I refuse to repeat them, but if even a percentage of them come, you know, come about, we can compute almost everything and we, we will use what I'll refer to soon as the global sensing grid to determine the initial and boundary conditions so we can go compute most of anything. Synbio, genomics, the bio world, bioproduction, i.e. you make things using bioprocesses. Biofunctionalism is things that you make have living pieces, like watering your airplane in the morning. And we are space hardening humans with uh, bio countermeasures for radiation. We are currently extending human life at 0.3 years per year. We've been doing that for a while now. Mm -hmm. Live another year, you get another 0.3 years to live statistically. Stanford medical people and others with all of the CRISPR stuff, all of the bio business that's going on, they say 10, 15 years, we should be extending human life at one year per year, which is a fairly interesting number. Uh, those of you that are not yet taking NAD plus, NAD plus, you really ought to think about doing that. Uh, this doesn't delay aging, it reverses it, and it works. Uh, we're closing in on aging cancer and, and, and so forth. Materials. We are now nanoprinting materials and producing superb microstructure which far less dislocations and grain boundary problems, and MIT, show up there, has five times better materials now, and he's closing in on 10, and we have 11 times better nanocomposites. This is much lighter everything. The gas mileage on your car is the weight of it primarily. So, you know, everything's lighter, including rockets. So the dry weight on rockets goes way down, and the payload fraction goes up commensurately. So another factor of three to five reduction in space access over the factor of 14 that Musk gave us by the renewable rockets at a time over the last 30 years when we would sell grandmothers for 10%, okay? And now we got factors of 75 plus another factor of five. Uh, th then there's, uh, the global sensor grid, nano and other increasingly cheap sensors everywhere. The Pentagon tells me in five to 10 years, 10 to 100 trillion sensors networked on this planet. And so this is really big data, okay? The AI people ought to be really happy about that. We are putting up 22,000 uh, 22, new LEO satellites to do EO. Without going to geo, we'll be able to stare everywhere 24-7, 365. Uh, the Japanese have put sensors on toilets, so you get a complete physical every time you use this device. <laughs> and uh, big data is now the fourth approach to tech, joining theory, experiment, and computation. We derive experiments from, from uh, I'm, I'm sorry, we derive equations from data now. The new tech normals. Uh, when I go and give seminars at universities, you spend most of the day wandering around talking to the faculty members. When I go into their office, they're always on a computer. I ask them, who, what are they doing? Who are they working with? It's always somebody in places you never think of, all over the world, okay? The new normal is network, decentralized, collaborative, multidisciplinary, and system of systems. Now, as all of you uh, superb business people know, 
In the industrial age, we created wealth by raping natural resources. Some people say exploiting. Uh, what we now create wealth with is by inventing things, okay? And the machines are now capable of inventing. The Chinese have many more human inventors than we do, and therefore we're gonna have to figure out machines that invent better than their machines. Uh, some of the major societal issues going forward that we need to address, and we will in these four that I'm gonna give you, uh, food and water shortages, particularly fresh water shortages, that is the dominant societal, almost existential issue now. Climate change. We recently, the past couple of days, had a new message out of the UN and the IPCC, International Panel on Climate Change, on, on, on climate change. Well, it turns out it's much worse than what they said. Uh, there are six major positive feedbacks which they are not including because we, NASA, the science organizations, haven't given them the data to enable them to do it. But that doesn't mean these six positive feedbacks aren't changing the climate rapidly, uh, even though we can't compute them yet or, or haven't included them. One of these is fossil methane in the tundra in the oceans. The tundra is warming twice as fast as the rest of the planet. And this is the methane hydrate, the ice that burns uh, it's coming out of the, of the tundra so fast that the ground is shaking like this. There's huge eruption holes where it comes out. It's bubbling out of, out of the lakes in Alaska, okay? It's bubbling off of the, uh, uh, out of the ocean, off of Santa Barbara, off the Bering Strait, off the U.S. East Coast. Uh, and methane is, is 22 times the effects of CO2 on the climate. There's massive amounts of fossil CO2 bubbling out, and CO2, historically, half of it went into the forest and half of it went into the ocean. Well, we've cut down a lot of the forests, and the oceans have taken up so much CO2 that the oceans have turned into weak carbonic acid, and their CO2 uptake is dropping, okay? And in the process, they've killed a lot of the algae. We've downed about 25 to 30 percent of the algae so far. Uh, the, the, uh, you know, they, there are others uh, which have not been included, but, but, but uh, the WAG estimates for what all these positive feedbacks mean in terms of climate crudely is a doubling of the IPCC estimates. So the IPCC says uh, the sea level rise 2100 is two and a half meters. Uh, it'll probably be twice that according to the positive feedbacks. And if you look at what the current IPCC estimates are for the ongoing climate change, they are way off. It's much higher for sea level rise, for ocean temperatures, for ocean acidification, and for CO2 level. The ecosystem is crashing. All are agreed that we're short about 50% of a planet now. Halfway through the year, we run the ecosystem into further deficit. This is pollution, ocean acidification, forest, topsoil, water, fish, extinctions, climate, and so forth. And as the Asians in their billions try to come to Western living standards, we're gonna be short three planets. The best NASA can do is terraform Mars, 150 years, that's only one planet, and it's way too late, okay? So what we're, what's gonna to have to happen is we will be driven inexorably because of the ecosystem problem and the sustainability in terms of the ecosystem. And growth forever was never possible with a finite ecosystem, says mathematics anyway. However, humans have been very exceedingly clever creating technologies that increasingly utilize resources. Uh, however, the abundance people from the Singularity University refuse to acknowledge that there's any kind of ecosystem problem, and so I'm involved with those people trying to educate them a little bit. <laughs> but, but, but growth based on quality is fine. It's just growth based on the ecosystem. The machines are taking the jobs. Marshall Brain, an interesting name, says that this time is different from the industrial age when that took jobs, okay, the machines took jobs, and since then, 
because this time we are inventing a second intelligent species. Okay, we never did that before. And as I just indicated previously a bit, that intelligent species can now create an IDE. And therefore, not even the creation and ideation jobs, and so the machines are going to take all the jobs. So the solution space is currently our make work jobs. We've got a few of those. We'll put in a few more, maybe. A guaranteed annual income, which five to 10 years ago, people said, no, 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 this is an anathema, it's a giggle factor, go away. Now, nine countries are seriously working on a guaranteed annual income, including parts of the US. Uh, then there's do it yourself on steroids with no jobs needed, and I'll get into that. Uh, an obvious issue is that businesses need customer buying power. The gig economy is developing partially due to the machines taking the jobs. It's growing rapidly. It's now 36% of the entire uh, 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 economy and climbing fast, but with less incomes and benefits. And therefore, you're already losing customer buying power as the machines take the jobs, okay? Henry Ford knew all about this. That's why he built the Model T, okay? All right. All right, the four developing major opportunities at $1 trillion or more. Uh, all of these are in progress now, some farther along than others but they're all nascent. The first one is transportation going electric. Land, sea, air, and space. The issue has been, what do you do about the long extension cord? Uh, <laughs> the you know, battery weight. I, I told you about the lithium metal batteries and the lithium air batteries that will essentially solve that problem, particularly the lithium air batteries. So we're off compared to chemical with the lithium ion about a factor of 10, and this will take care of it. Also, NASA recently, I recently published a paper that uh, uh, indicated all of the ways to reduce drag and weight. So I was not only raising the bridge, but lowering the river, okay? And so we can do this, okay? We can, you know, go electric. Uh, for the air case currently developing, is 110 new vehicle designs from 35 countries worldwide. People are seriously spending money going into this thing, Uber and the rest of them. And a guy at Uber that's in charge of this came from my shop. And what they're working on is personal air vehicles that will eventually operate off the street in front of your house, uh, no air airports. This is a new $1 trillion year plus aero market. The huge list of electric benefits include the following. No fires when you crash, twice the propulsion efficiency, quieter, reduced vibration, much lower energy costs, green using renewable energy electrics, high reliability, far fewer parts and cost, huge climate benefits. And right now, Mark, the Chinese own 80% of this market. Okay, so we've got our work cut out, you know, for us. Okay. Uh, there's a downside to going electric. Stranded assets, petroleum going away, because most of petroleum is, is heavy transportation fuels and no more after we go electric. I had four summer students from City College London, business faculty with me this summer, and I asked them, okay, economics experts, what happens when petroleum goes away? End of the summer, they came back and said, most of the retirement people that have most of the money that's invested actually are heavily into petroleum. And so what would happen if it goes away too fast is a recession about three times worse than the 08 recession, okay? So we're, we're gonna have to manage this a little bit. All right, the next one, number two, this is, should be new to you, I think, is a near-term simultaneous solution for land, water, food, energy, and climate. Yes, we're going to talk about solving world hunger, okay? Uh, halophytes. The plant world is broken up into glycophytes and halophytes. Glycophytes are freshwater plants, what you see, your agriculture. Halophytes are saltwater plants. They grow on deserts and wastelands where there's not much fresh water, so they got used to growing in saltwater, okay? 
They have huge deep roots that sequester 18% of the CO2 from their take up, okay? Uh, they grow on deserts and wastelands. 44% of the land is deserts and wastelands. It's not productive right now. Uh, and they use saline, seawater, agriculture, uh, seawater, which is 97% of all the land. So cheap land, cheap water to do this transfer to halophytes, okay? How much is an acre of land in, in the middle of the Sahara cost? Okay, not a whole lot. Uh, and how much does seawater cost? And these deserts and wastelands have a lot of solar, and PV is so bloody cheap that you can pump the seawater. This is not a problem. Uh, and uh, so we've got the tech for this, just farming. We can do it quick. Seawater has trace minerals needed in the human diet that we've depleted from the arable land, like selenium. That's why a lot of us take selenium tablets. Uh, and seawater contains 80% of the nutrients required to grow plants, so not much fertilizer. Uh, and uh, the University of Nottingham in the UK has developed a way for almost all plants to do what the uh, soy and alfalfa plants do, which is to take up nitrogen from the air, so you won't have to worry about that either. Uh, the benefits are huge. Uh, you can grow all the food anybody wants to eat cheaply. Uh, and uh, there's huge biomass for petrochemical feedstock, which is the other use of petroleum, okay? There's huge petrochemical, uh, huge biomass for renewable energy. Uh, overall, it solves land, brings 44% more land in. Solves water, if you grow food this way, you get back to 70% of the water that's now used for conventional agriculture for direct human use and solves water. We don't have to worry about that for a while. Food, all the food you wanna eat. Energy, because it's now biomass and climate because it's sequestering and, and, and because it's biomass energy. Uh, this is the last major human ecosystem play. It's got huge capacity. Uh, you turn the Sahara, the Atacamba, Southwest US, the uh, Western Australia, the Middle East, uh, the Smithsonian, the, the uh, uh, Gobi Desert and so forth, uh, you know, all into productive land. The Saudis have a group in England that does their business development for them sometimes. And they called me and they said, the Saudis are worried that they're running out of, out of oil and people don't want oil, okay? So what should they do with their economy? So I asked them, I said, well, do the Saudis have any sand? And they said, yeah, we got sand. And I said, do they have any seawater? Uh, yeah, so I put them on the halophytes. So there is now a major halophyte investment near Aswan in Egypt. The uh, people uh, near the Red Sea and, and the Gulf uh, are, are now growing halophytes. Boeing's working with them. United Arab Emirates to grow airplane fuel uh, and also food and fodder. The Indian subcontinent for hundreds of years has had a halophyte agriculture on their coastlines, uh, coastal regions, growing food and fodder very, very successfully, okay? Uh, this is an interesting way to uh, solve land, water, food, energy, and climate. And this is the agriculture business, which is bigger than the IT business, okay? which most of the new business people have been living off of for decades, okay? Various forms and features differently in the IT business. We're still doing that, okay? The ag business is much bigger, okay? I said I do uh, trillion dollar businesses. This is one of them, okay? This is a huge one. Okay, uh, the other remaining ecosystem play is the utilization of ever cheaper renewable energy uh, to extract more of the 46 minerals that are present in the ocean. We don't have to go mine asteroids. The stuff is available in the oceans. All we need to do is cheap energy to go get it. Far cheaper than, than you know, getting it from asteroids. Okay, the third one <coughs> is 
do it yourself on steroids. We've talked a little bit about some of these. You can now, at your home, do distributed energy generation. There's hundreds of thousands of people who have cut the cord, go down to Walmart, buy PV, buy some batteries, and they're in business. Uh, f uh, there's there's tele-ed, telemedicine, tele-everything, at-home printing, manufacturing. People with the bio can now grow family food on a half acre. Uh, there's six acres available per person. Uh, in the Industrial Revolution, uh, before the Industrial Revolution, before 1830 in this country and, and around the world, there were no jobs. 94% of the workforce were subsistence farmers and worked the land and were independent. Okay? The Industrial Revolution came along and invented jobs and moved us into cities and we learned how to spell alienation. Okay? And what uh, can happen here is that with the ongoing capability to shift to do it yourself and do everything at your place. This is the run out of the gig economy and you won't need a job, okay? And so the 1% the and the 99% problem goes away, okay? And almost all of the others, land, water, food, energy, and climate, if you're doing everything on your holding, okay? The way we used to do it, okay? Before we got in this mess, okay? Uh, this, this will, you know, will in fact work. It changes econometrics and much else massively. It was tried in this country as a local experiment in the 60s and 70s with the hippies and the greening of, of, of the country. The tech wasn't ready then, it's ready now. It's here now to do this, okay? I've got a friend who lives on the top of a butte south of here and not connected to anything except electrons and photons as happy as a clam, okay? It works. And the equipage for these DIY homes is easily in multiple trillions of dollars going forward. All right, the last one is commercial space to and from, to and beyond geo. Current commercial space is $350 billion of geo and below, primarily positional earth utilities, telecom, and so forth. Uh, what we're now talking about is going out beyond geo to colonize and do various things, mining and manufacturing and so forth. Uh, people are working now, space utilities for beyond geo, comms, energy, fuel, transportation, maintenance, repair, life support. People are working space mining for out there. Uh, the reusable rockets with a factor of 14 less space access costs uh, will greatly help all of this space beyond geo, space business. This is real space business, not just commercialization of government activities. Uh, the uh, space manufacturing, the problem was the cost of getting up and down. There's a lot of people with really good business cases to do space manufacturing. There's, there's a lot of good things you can do if you don't have gravity around and so forth. And, and, and uh, the problem's been the transportation cost. What I call now space beachcombing, this is getting rid of the space debris, which is about to take us out of the space business completely, particularly as we put up another 22,000 satellites, okay? Uh, the problem with space debris is legally, whoever puts this in space still owns it. There's about, three million pieces of stuff up there of various size, and each screw and nut is still owned by somebody, but you never figure out who, okay? And you can't touch it until you get a release from them, okay? So this has held up the space debris problem. I, I assume this is gonna be fixed, okay? Now, it turns out we can now do space beach combing and work this with a, an electromagnetic tether which you uh, energize either with uh, our nuclear battery or with solar, and this allows us to go everywhere and collect this stuff without using fuel, okay? Because of the Earth's magnetic field. So this is cheap. So what do you do with this stuff when you collect it? Well, 
We're trying to work space manufacturing. So you put this stuff in a space junkyard and you redo it and repurpose it, okay? And to add to the space junkyard, okay, in space manufacturing, as the space station, uh, you know, goes into happy hunting ground, uh, instead of coming down and burning it up, we boost it and add it to the space junkyard because there's an awful lot of high quality aluminum and other stuff in there that, you know, that we can use that we then don't have to loft, okay? Uh, so, so far, uh, we've uh, talked about most of, of or, or, you know, many things that we should do in space. Uh, for space manufacturing, there's excellent business plans for fiber optics, pharma, crystals, and so forth. Uh, cheap space will help all that. Okay, now space tourism. The issues are cost and safety. Uh, cost will be helped by the cheap space. Safety is an issue, a big issue. Rockets blow up about every t hundred times, okay? And people can now ride on commercial aircraft for many, many millions of miles. So we've got to do something about the reliability of rockets, one. Two, when you put people in space, they're, uh, as you'll hear in the morning at the first panel at eight, uh, they're affected by microgravity and uh, uh, galactic cosmic rays. Microgravity decimates the immune system, makes you blind, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, it affects every physiological system, ruins your DNA, takes down your immune system. So does the radiation. This radiation is not the Hiroshima radiation, which was uh, photons, x-rays, and gammas. This is three orders of magnitude, greater energy level, and it's particle radiation, and it's iron nuclei, fully ionized iron from stars and other things. And this stuff is bad. Uh, when we go to Mars, uh, we're going to have to surround the vehicle with about three and a half meters of polyethylene to take care of the radiation. We're going to have to do artificial gravity to take care of the microgravity. When they go to Mars, they're gonna to have to live under four meters of regolith to protect them from the radiation. All of these cartoons you see of these little thin halves that they're living in, and, and it looks like they're playing golf on the surface in these spacesuits that can't protect them at all. No, that's really not very feasible, okay? Uh, one other thing we can look at doing in space, there's one mission now that's looking into this, is quantum computing and quantum operations in space. The issue that space can help is uh, decoherence. We need to delay decoherence. Decoherence occurs because of, of interference with the quantum states, and you lose it, and then you've lost it. Uh, so what you need to delay to Decoherence is excellent vacuum, low temperatures and quiet conditions, and that's sort of space, okay? And, and so uh, probably the best place for a serious quantum computer is in space. All right, beyond five years, and then I'll get off the stage with a short thing. Beyond five years, there's an excellent Wikipedia page about the unsolved problems in physics. At cosmological scales, there are major issues. None, none know what dark matter and dark energy are. There's 96% of what up there. We don't even know if it's real, okay? Uh, it turns out that quantum electrodynamics here is up to 14 decimal places accurate. Qu quantum electrodynamics and quantum chromodynamics up there, when they use it, as many have, to uh, predict the, the cosmological constant, is off by 120 orders of magnitude, okay? The physicists should hang their heads in shame, okay? <laughs> and in terms of what you're taught in physics is that nothing can go faster than the speed of light, right? Well, there's, uh, there's quantum entanglement, which is what quantum technology is pretty much based on. It works. Quantum entanglement, has been, the speed of it has been recently measured by the Chinese, and the best sensors in the world 
it is in excess of 10,000 times the speed of light. Okay? Nobody knows what or why. We don't know what's going on at cosmological scales. If we ever do, we can probably figure out how to do uh, uh, faster than light transportation and we can become an interstellar society, not just uh, one in the solar system. All right, going off the stage. Uh, this community is proficient in re-engineering industries and innovation. This community could reinvent transportation, all modes, reinvent agriculture, and solve almost all of the major to existential society issues, and in the process, make trillions. It's all what you want to do, gentlemen and ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, I, I asked Mark as a favor. My ears are as old as the rest of me. So, you know, if you ask a question, when you ask a question, he's, you know, he's going to repeat it so I know what it is so I can answer it. We have runners, I think, with uh, microphones. There's one. Just raise your hand if you have a question. Over here. Over here. Quick, quick question. Um, the... Uh, you talked about magnetic space junk and being able to attract it with magnetic, uh, with these magnetic capabilities, but isn't most of it aluminum and other type of materials that are non-magnetic? And then second question I have is the uh, Russian satellites that are moving in um, unknown and unusual paths. In other words, satellites are no longer just satellites, but now they are, uh, they are moving around in unknown and unexplained patterns. Can you comment on that? and the evolution you see of satellites with that similar technology. And Ty, say the first one a little more carefully. <clears throat> the, magnet, the space junk, if it's in lightweight materials, um, not necessarily magnetic oh. to use the Earth's magnetic yeah, field, yeah. and therefore you can't catch it because it's not yeah. magnetic. Yeah. So um, first one is if you're, if you're collecting space junk, you're using a magnetic tool to collect it, and it's all of these new composites that are not magnetic, how do you do that? Oh, okay. Uh, uh, space junk, you can work nets, okay? Uh, you know, I'm not, we don't use magnetics. Uh, you can go up and grapple it, okay? Uh, in space warfare, y you may have heard about grapplers for taking out the other guy's satellite, okay? You know, there's all kinds of ways to do that. The, the problem with the space junk taking care of it is one, the legalities, and the other is it's hugely expensive to do all of this weight changing and so forth. And it's only when you can go fuelless that you can just put some of them up there and let them go. What's the and the second one is the Russians apparently have satellites up there that um, uh, I'll describe. They're moving in strange ways. And they may not be normal satellites, maybe doing something different. And so what's that all about? Uh, no comment. <laughs> Oh, come on now. No, 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 no. Killer satellites? Are they? No? Okay, all right. No, no. Sorry, Ty. What, no, no. Two? Uh, what, <laughs> what, what, you know, what he didn't tell you is I'm the NASA rep to the National Intelligence Council. And so I got to be a little careful. Yeah. Okay. Next question. Uh, hi. Um, so you spoke of a, um, so you spoke of humans as, you know, becoming cyborgs but you also spoke of the creation of a second intelligent species. And I was curious if you could describe what that species would be like and what that would look like. So you talked about cyborgs, but you also talked about the creation of a second intelligent species. Yes. What would that look like? Uh, the second intelligent species is any robot with a good AI in its head. Okay. Uh, the, the experience so far is that the AI, even 
this initial AI is getting really, really good. Uh, and I talked to one person here who tells me he even thinks he knows why it's so good. Everybody else I've talked to in the AI business says, I don't know why it's doing it, but it's doing it and it's working. Okay. Uh, the business with the brain replicants is interesting. It's more than interesting. It's going to be a revolution uh, because I don't know how many niche areas. W what we need for that second intelligence species is AGI, artificial general intelligence, not just niche intelligence, which is about all we've got now. Okay. But uh, the physical characteristics, you know, you can put anything, you know, they've got robots now that look like people, look like dogs, look like anything. That's not an issue. Next question. Well, you, uh, you dropped the NAD uh, thing this earlier, and so I want to ask you, you've obviously been taking NADs. Uh, how long, and uh, can you recommend a brand uh, for people to look at? So you mentioned NAD Plus. Yes. Um, obviously, you're taking it. Uh, yeah. How long have you been taking it, and what do you recommend for a brand? OK. Uh, if, if, you, if you Google NAD Plus, you find out that people have been working on this for 30 years, really good people. They, they did the usual mouse models, and they took mice that were totally gray and decrepit, okay, walking around with canes, if mice do that, and uh, they turned them into young mice, okay? So there's FDA tests now on humans, and so forth and so on, and the people that are into this kind of business are all taking this stuff. So uh, there's, you know, this is all on a whip. Uh, for $35, you get 30, 40 pills. You can get them anywhere from 100 milligrams up to 250 milligrams. Uh, I took them one bottle for a month. All the strength came back, all of it. Uh, it fixed a bunch of stuff. Stuff started falling off my skin. Uh, it's fantastic. The, the, there is only one other thing that, that I messed with, okay? I'm a, uh, I'm a health nut, okay? And uh, the other one was uh, the amino acids, arginine, and ornithine. Uh, three to one ar arginine to ornithine, three to five grams uh, at bedtime on an empty stomach with some water. You wake up, your mouth is dry because everything's getting fixed. And this is a growth hormone releaser, which NAD is not. NAD fixes the ends of your mitocardia, okay? Uh, the growth hormone releaser was wonderful. The problem is it's a, it's a growth hormone releaser, and therefore, if you have nascent cancer, it makes that grow too, okay? So once I figured that out, I got off of that, but, <laughs> but, but, but while taking it, it fixed a whole bunch of stuff. So, you know, we are getting closer to fixing human physiology seriously. Uh, the CRISPR stuff is having great success and a few failures, but it's learning fast. Okay. Uh, one. Do you have a microphone? You, you mentioned that you had issues with the abundance people and that crowd. Could you talk a little bit more about where those differences are? They're way too upbeat. Their claims are a bit extreme. And th by being upbeat, I mean they don't take into account the ecosystem problems. Uh, they, they don't talk about the downsides of some of the technologies that they talk about. It, it's just this golden light thing, nirvana, okay? It, which is not practical yet and not realistic the way usual systems develop and function. Thank you. Another question? Thank you for a, a wonderful talk. 
it seems to me that one of the biggest challenges that we have is not technologically oriented, but educationally oriented. I, I see just this growing uh, divide between the people who can understand your talk and our current K through 12 educational system, um, which does not seem to be keeping pace or maybe even not even not pace, but can't decide whether to teach evolution or not. Um, I wonder if you could speak to how we might fix our educational system. Okay, yes, sir, I understand. Uh, the American education system is broke. It's dead broke. Uh, the, the, the teachers do not know how to spell motivation. Okay? And uh, we did a uh, study where we did some software and built into the software the motivational precepts of, of what keeps the SEALs in during Hell Week, what works psychological motivation, what works in the workplace, what works with homeschooling. And that software, the kids just loved it. It was more fun than anything they'd ever done, okay? If we built motivation into both the online and the physical instruction, that would help, okay? A major problem with what you mentioned is that in this country, Parade Magazine every once in a while prints who makes what, okay? And if you look at who makes what, these are the heroes of, of the education people undergoing, and, and it's, it's, it's sport figures, it's entertainment figures, it's not like in Russia and Germany and China where the intellectuals have any kind of uh, prestige at all, okay? I mean, people in my business dress down on the weekends, okay, to try to fit in. This is a societal disaster in terms of fixing the kind of, you have to motivate people, and this is part of the motivation. Totally agree with that. Uh, so we have, there's one right there. Uh, you talk, is this working? Yeah. yeah, there we go. You talked about emergence, and you talked about the parts of the brain waking up, and then you made a, a reference to the web. I'd like to hear more about that. And then I'd like you to relate that to AI and AGI. Right. So you talked about emergence, yeah, and then the AI, uh, how the brain wakes up, and AI and AGI. Most of this is supposition. Uh, the, uh, th th there's a literature on this that I suggest you read. Uh, nobody knows how the brain works. Uh, and, uh, you know, the kind of details you're asking for, I'm not sure exist. Uh, when, I, when I stated that, it, it was as something that, that people had published, and that's it. Thank you. Um, <laughs> first time in five years they've been stupid enough to do that. Um, a quick question on the, uh, on the space side, kind of take it back off of the, the personal side. I saw recently that the Japanese are trying to do a little pilot on a space elevator. Do you think that's at all reasonable given, you know, Bryn and the other books that we've read on that? Yeah, I got it. Single point of failure systems, okay? There's all kinds of, there's some books written on space elevators. People thought when uh, quantum nano, uh, I'm sorry, carbon nanotubes came along that that, that, you know, that was going to do it. Well, no. It turns out that space elevators and so forth are uh, acted on by atomic oxygen and other things. They're huge, expensive capital projects, okay? Uh, and they're single point of failure systems. And as an engineer, no. As a taxpayer or even a, a stockholder with their costs and so forth, no. Okay, solve that problem. <laughs> Joe? <that>. What? <laughs> What do you think are going to prove to be the trickiest things about colonizing Mars? I mean, you mentioned how transportation is getting 
cheaper. We, all, we have to worry about radiation. There's, you know, are we actually going to be able to mine enough water or materials on the planet to be able to make fuel and so forth? Like, what do you think is going to turn out to be the, the trickiest problem to solve? And what and what's your sort of realistic timeline? All right. All right. The Mars issues are cost and safety. Safety includes reliability because the, the repair stations are kind of far apart once you go to Mars. Uh, the costs are on their way down because we can make a lot of stuff there with in-situ resource utilization with all the massive resources on Mars. Okay. Uh, and Musk, bless his soul, uh, the renewable rockets. The costs of getting to space the irreducible cost is the 0.4% of the cost, which is the fuel. All the rest of it we can reduce. And he's gone, and you know, so, so better materials to get the dry weight down, reusable and so forth and so on, and totally robotic, okay? This is robotic design, robotic manufacture, robotic transfer, robotic ops, it's people that cost money, okay? You, you want to pull cost out of anything, and that's why people are losing their jobs to the machines, okay? You get rid of people. And by the way, in aerospace, people are responsible for 80% of the safety problems, okay? If you want a safe system, no people, okay? All right, now, you, you, you know, you ask what's, you know, what's the major problem? A major problem, is psychological. We try to work with the submarine people and so forth and so on, but there's grave concern that you shoot people up in this little thing for quite a ways, and it's going to be, you know, they may kill each other before, who knows, okay? So there's the psychological problem. Uh, it's better initially if they go fast. These are called fast transits. I, I described this nuke battery. This nuke battery, one of the things it can do is to power Vasimir, which is a high thrust MHD electric propulsion system that has 6,000 seconds of ISP instead of 453.35, which is all you get from hydrogen oxygen, which is the best chemical system, okay? By powering Vasimir with this nuke battery, we can do Mars in 200 days round trip, which is equal to the six months that we've put people up on station so far, which is survivable, okay? And another way to get the cost down and to make this all more reasonable is about three or four years before the humans go, you send the uh, autonomous robotics with printing machines to get all of those massive resources on Mars. Everything is on Mars. I'm going to talk tomorrow morning about making Mars the, the Walmart for the entire inner solar system. Okay? We can do this. Uh, we can make everything on Mars that the people need because we can get carbon out of the atmosphere, we can get hydrogen and oxygen out of the water, which means we have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, which means we can make all the methane and all the fuel, which means we can make all the plastics, and we can make anything and everything out of plastics. We can even make conductors out of plastics, okay? So we, we can make it all there, we don't have to haul it with them, we don't have to haul it from here, okay? And that means that it's all there, the coffee's perking before humans leave home, and all you now have to do is the humans and their equipage, which scales with their size, unfortunately. Everything's shrinking except the humans. We've got to figure out a way to shrink the humans, okay, to get the cost really down, but that's more difficult, okay? Uh, realistically, Mar Musk is saying, by 26, he'll have people on or around Mars, uh, if not before. Uh, other people are saying similar things. NASA is going to take a while longer <laughs> for several reasons, <laughs> uh, which I won't go into here. No comment. Okay. Uh, I think we always have people here from 
all over the place. Europe, I know they're here. For, so uh, maybe two more questions, and then we'll wrap it up. So uh, do we have, here's one. Um, with regard to uh, uh, rapid space propulsion, uh, what are your thoughts on the viability and value of uh, laser-propelled light sails? Um, regarding propulsion, laser-driven light sails? Okay. Uh, along with transporting the humans rapidly and safely, there's freighters, cyclers, okay, which can be slow boats. Sails come in many varieties. Uh, there's the light sails, which can be either photons uh, off of the sun or lasers. There's particle sails, okay, magnetic rings. Uh, you can even launch stuff out there at sails, okay, per se. Uh, we call them slow boats cyclers and uh, freighters, okay? And uh, the people that are thinking about doing space commercialization, mining, and hauling stuff around, yeah, need to think about it, seriously. I was thinking in particular about interstellar or very rapid light uh, craft. Interstellar? Like breakthrough star shot. I'm very familiar with that project. Uh, that's the current front runner. It's going to take forever. Mm. Okay, it's it, it's. We need a much better way to do interstellar. Much better, something that's fuelless. Okay, uh, there's a whole book written on different ways to do this. And it's all wrapped up with what I castigated, which is physics at cosmological scales, and what's really going on, which we don't know. OK, last question. Oh, yes, tough, yes. tough. Um, Dennis, thank you so much for sharing the wisdom. And I, I want to change gears a little bit. Let's talk about nanotechnology you briefly discuss in your talk. Um, what are your thoughts about the toxicologic, toxicological effects of these new materials that we're building, not only to us, but to the environment as well? Uh, the prince in England had it about right, Prince Charles, years ago. Okay. We don't know. We do not, and it's not just nanoparticles, which, by the way, 98% of all of the studies I've seen say that the nanoparticles are bad for human physiology, okay? Very few, you know, they're, they're good for some medical processes, but overall, in terms of the overall physiology, no. Uh, but it's not just that, okay? The chemicals that we've been putting into and end up in the, sh the fish halfway across the bloody Atlantic, okay, is, is taking down the capability of males to incite children, okay? It's, it's altering all kinds of stuff. We have not done good service to ourselves because we are terminally tactical. The Chinese have a 1,000-year planting cycle, the Japanese 140 years, the U.S. planting cycle is three months on Wall Street to the four-year presidential cycle, period. Uh, I do these kind of briefs on advanced techs and where is it all going and so forth, and I publish. I actually run with the dogs that do futurism seriously internationally. And the, the bad things are never studied uh, and need to be, okay? We, 
we, we need far more foresight and we need to study hindsight to inform the foresight. But you're dead on. 